during my live stream preview, please wait a moment. Okay. Oh, during my live this stream preview, it's live. please wait a moment. Wow. That worked pretty slick, actually. Hmm. Amazing. There was a change on YouTube's end. They changed um, some back-end technical junk, and I wasn't sure if it was going to cause problems with today's broadcast, but um, it actually kicked in quicker than normal. So, got that going for us, which is nice. I hope everybody's having a good whatever time of day it is for you. Um, here it is a different time of day than it is usually, uh, which is to say that um, the, uh, what do you call it, the daylight savings time kicked in. I don't know if they do that everywhere in the world, but um, here in America we still keep holding on to a sort of strange kind of, um, I don't know if it's a, tra a tradition or what, but we change the, the clocks, we move them forward in the spring, and we move them back, spring forward, fall back, uh, you know, twice a year. And um, I believe it used to be for farmers so that they got more working time out in the sun, but as it turns out, we have electric lights now, so I don't know we need to keep doing it, but we do. So that's why this show, to some of you, might be at a different time. I see there's no daylight savings in Japan. So uh, someone just mentioned that. Same kind of deal. Anyway, hope you're all doing well wherever and whenever you are. Brooklyn, New York, Saskatchewan, hot Georgia. It is cool here. It is 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about, about it. Uh, do we have snow yet in Wisconsin? We don't. I mean, way, way, way up north, I think there was some earlier this week, but we haven't really had any here yet. I'm in like the middle part of the state. <clears throat> Good morning from Chicago. Uh, let's see here. What else have we got? Seattle, Sweden, um, Austria slash Vienna, Sunderland, Istanbul, was Constantinople. Was Constantinople. That's true. Um, Germany, Canada, Maryland, Plymouth, England. Thanks for the photo tips video. Well, I, not a problem. I, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Sunny Scotland. Well, that's something you don't hear every day, from what I understand. Uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. Backwoods, Georgia, France, Milan, Milan, it's I-L, so I don't know if that's Milan, Italy, or Milan, Illinois, well, one of the two, either way, Bridgeville, Pennsylvania, uh, let's see here, Poland, California, Monterey, Sydney, there's VJ Morph, how you doing, Finland, Detroit, Michigan, oh my goodness, we've got a bunch of people here, Houston, Congratulations on the baseball thing. I think that that was a, that you guys just won the World Series. I'm not a sports fan, um, but I think I heard that. Fort Collins, Colorado, Australia, New York, Sweden, Serbia. I don't know if we've had anybody from Serbia before that I can remember, but uh, welcome. <clears throat> Let's see here. What else have we got? Pox walkers. Oh wait, no, that's not a place. Uh, Necronid says painted two pox walkers this morning. Well, good. I mean, you know, I've other than taking a shower and getting all this set up, uh, I haven't done jack this morning. Um, I did make coffee, I guess. So there's that. Florida leads. Null two two five says hello from chilly Robin Hood country here in Nottingham, UK. Well, it's not only uh, you know uh, Robin Hood. Uh, area, uh, country. It's also Wargaming country in that um, Nottingham, from what I understand, is where Games Workshop, um, Warlord Games, guys who make Bolt Action and Conflict 47, are also based out of Nottingham. And um, the subject of today's video, Mantic Games, also based out of Nottingham. So um, I have over here, that's the wrong side, a uh, copy of Star Saga showed up in the mail Wednesday? Wednesday or Thursday. And um, something in my eye, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so they sent it, Mantic sent it to me, and I know that the Kickstarter people don't have their copies yet. Um, I get the feeling that this is maybe a production sample. I mean, it's like the full, you know, it's the actual version. But I think that manufacturing, they have a tendency to send out a bunch 
like when they get final manufacturing done, they send out a bunch to the, the company that you know they're working for, in this case Mantic, and say, here you go, take a look. And um, so I think that this is one of those, just from the paperwork that they sent, it said, you know, it said Star, uh, Star Saga sample. So that's what made me think that. Um, from what I understand, the Kickstarters should be getting theirs in December. I have a suspicion that that's probably when they'll also end up in stores as well. But uh, yeah, so I've been a fan of uh, Dungeon Saga for quite a while. So I'm looking forward to opening this. I have not yet opened it. So we will both be opening it together, <clears throat> which will be fun. Tampa, Florida, Northwest Indiana, Calgary, Alberta. Hello, Kyle. Um, Lazy Sigma writes says, hi from the moon. Well, that's, I didn't know we had, you know, internet up to the moon, but that's, it, it's a long cable, but yeah. VJ Morph says, you get a chance to play Shadespire yet, Adam? Play much Shadespire yet? Much Shadespire? No. Some Shadespire? Yes. Uh, I have. And actually, my plan is to play a little bit more this afternoon with a friend of mine. Um, we're planning on getting together at the local shop and playing. They've got a big X-Wing tournament going on. But, and so because of that, that's one of the reasons we're planning on getting together to play Shadespire instead of, say, Age of Sigmar, because we'll be using about a two foot by two foot area as opposed to a four foot by six foot area and the shop is not as big as as me or the shop owner would like so that's where we're at um six gunner 86 says painting ruins for necromunda and listening to adam what a sunday well i'm glad that you're having a good time um from what i understand and this is uh don't tell anybody um but from what i understand i should be receiving a copy of necromunda in the mail potentially even Maybe maybe Monday, but in theory, I think this upcoming week I should be getting a copy of Necromunda in the mail. So I will, um, yeah. So that'll be cool. I'm looking forward to that. <clears throat> VJ Morph said, "So I got Shadespire. Absolutely love it. Picked up the Orc faction yesterday. Can't wait to play them." Yeah, the um, I mean, it's it's very different from a normal miniatures game. Right off the bat, understand it's not like a normal miniatures style game. It is a definitely a, a gateway game in that it is. Um, I mean, it's a little bit like X-Wing and it's designed to be played sort of quickly. It's designed, although even quick, more quickly than um, X-Wing, it's designed to be played uh, slightly competitively if you want to. I mean, it can. Um, you don't have to, obviously. Um, and then you have these factions. Like, the main box comes with uh, the the, Sig the Sigmarites and the uh, Blood Reavers or whatever. The corn guys versus the good guys. And... Um, uh, I can't think of the guy's name. The leader of each team, the Garrick's Reavers, and you know, something. Um, I can remember the woman's name, something Bright Shield. Anyway, so they're cool models, great models. Uh, I painted them up. I showed them a little bit. I think here uh, I took them with me to Utah to Valhalla. They were great. It was a lot of fun. And um, the skeletons are my next purchase. There's going to be a box, the Sepatural Guard, I believe they're called, and it's a box of seven skeletons that comes with their cards and all the parts. And it's just basically you buy a faction box, kind of like you do with with Blood Bowl, where you buy, like, a box, and then you get a team. Except in this one, you get the box with the team, you know, the faction, and then you also get the cards that you need and all that kind of stuff. And so, it's cool. Looking forward to it. Ewan says, so Star Saga, what is it? I've heard of Dungeon Saga, but know nothing about it. So, Star Saga is like Dungeon Saga, only it's in space. Uh, it's, a, it's, again, a gateway to style game. It's, um, tile based so you've got hallways and things like that if you think along the lines of like let's say something like um oh gosh uh like space hulk you know space hulk's got tiles and then you've got figures that go along with it um it has some similarities with space hulk it's got the little doors you know in space hulk the doors are cardboard doors and they're on little plastic standees in this the doors that come with it are like hard plastic. There's bulkhead doors, there's furniture, there's all kinds of stuff. Here's all the tiles and junk. There's lots of figures, there's books, there's cards, there's all kinds of, this is hard to do upside down, uh, templates, not up backwards, not upside down. Um, so yeah, all this stuff comes in this box, um, and it is designed to be played like a dungeon crawler, except it's a sci-fi dungeon crawler. Um, multiple different types of scenarios and missions, so you put the tiles together in different formats to play different games. If you've played, like I said, Dungeon Saga, it's kind of along those lines to some degree. Previous to Dungeon Saga, there was also Dwarf King's Hold. I owned, gosh, 
two of the Dwarf Kings hold games. It was the one with the orcs mostly and the one with the skeletons mostly versus dwarves on both of those. And then there was also, they did make Project Pandora, which is the sci-fi versions of those. Those came in much thinner boxes. All the parts and the pieces, because it was earlier days of Mantic, they were a little bit flimsier and stuff like that. With Dungeon Saga, one of my favorite things about Dungeon Saga, and it's so stupid, but I absolutely loved with Dungeon Saga the fact that the box looked like a giant book, and you could put it, and it opened like a book. Like the, the dungeon, it's down in the basement, so I can't just grab it. But... It, you know, like it had like a, a spine on this side that was actually a bit curved and it said Dungeon Saga and stuff like that. And then there was a cover. It wasn't a square box like this. It was book shaped. And you opened the cover. There was like a little magnet to keep it closed. And everything went in that. And every expansion that's come out for Dungeon Saga since has been another little book. So you can keep them on your shelf to look like books, but they're actually games. This is, you know, wouldn't work in the same way. They'd have to make it look like a giant data pad or something, which I don't think they want to do. But that was really cool. And that's one of the things. That's it. One, it, honestly, to me, as an outside viewer who doesn't doesn't know a ton about the the inside workings of the company of, at all over there at Mantic, I mean, I've you know talked with a bunch of the guys, and I know Ronnie. Um, it seems like with Dungeon Saga, that's when things got turned up. Like all of a sudden, like just the graphics, like they had been doing Dreadball and Dead Zone and things like that. But the the book layout, the graphical layout, just the artwork, the everything really went up a notch with Dungeon Saga, and they're doing the same type of thing in my mind with um, Star Saga as well. So yeah, I'm gonna uh, open that soon, but I'm gonna answer a couple more questions, so that's where we're at. <clears throat> oh, what else have we got? Do, 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 do. Overtime made easier with the show. Well, I'm glad we're helping you with that. Uh, what else have we got? Jez Hunt says that's a whole box of fun right there. I'm hoping so. Uh, Jay Thomas says, got the Sepatrol guard and accoutrement yesterday. I really appreciate the easy fit for them. Much easier, much better than the fiddly bits for the multi-part kit. See, I thought that the, the skeleton guys and the orc guys weren't coming out till next weekend. Maybe I got that number mixed up. Anyway, because my local shop didn't have them, so I'm going to have to, um, yeah, I'm going to have to get that. Because I really want the skeleton guys. I just, I'm a big fan of skeletons. That's the way it works. As it turns out, I have a skeleton. It's under all of this. So, yeah, uh, what else we got here? Filet Mignon says, ready to paint those... Actually, it's Filet Mignon, isn't it? Interesting. Or, or is it? I don't know. Uh, ready to paint those sci-fi furnitures. Yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of doing a little bit of that, too. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Hmm. I painted my first Frostgrave figure yesterday, and by the way, you look like my dad. Not sure if it's funny or scary. Well, uh, I'm good with either way. And uh, cool for uh, for painting Frostgrave uh, miniatures. I uh, actually currently have... So I built two Frostgrave warbands quite some time ago out of some GW stuff, kit bashed with some other stuff. I've got some Reaper Bone stuff in there. I've got some Reaper Metal stuff in there. So I've got two 10-man or 10-person uh, um, warbands. And they've been sitting in my basement for quite some time, and I've been playing with them unpainted like a jerk, in my opinion. And um, so I finally, but I just, I've got so much other stuff to work on, and I've only got so many hours in the day because I got, you know, got a day job and I've got making videos and doing this kind of jazz. So I finally decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find a commission painter, and there's a local commission painter. Uh, it's not Sam. Sam's very, very busy. <laughs> and, um, uh, but we'll be seeing him again soon on the channel. But he's been very, very busy as far as his paint queue. It's out a good ways into 2018. So I found a guy locally uh, who also does really good work. And uh, his name is Brandon. And he has a studio called Brushbound Studios. And so I gave him the models three weeks ago, maybe. And he's been working on those. And I'm going to get them hopefully back in early December. And it'll be the full 20, so two squads of 10. And um, then I'll be able to use them to hopefully start doing some battle reports. Because obviously I don't want to do any battle reports with unpainted stuff. That would be weird. So, yeah, that's coming. Um, but I'll do like a, a video kind of showcase of the work and all that stuff once it gets done. I'm looking forward to that. Because I'm just, I've, like I've seen stuff. He's got a, a Facebook page, Brushbound Studios. And uh, a lot of the stuff looks really good. So I'm really looking forward to, um, and I've seen his stuff in person too. I was at a small convention in Wapaka, Wisconsin back in January, and I walked by his Age of Sigmar army, not even knowing who he was at the time, and I was just like, wow, and it was, I was, it was like the big, huge Iron Tusk guys or whatever. Really, really, really nice. So, looking forward to it, definitely. 
Hey, Adam, I think I have a good question for you, and I did not know when to ask you. Um, shall we paint real or nice? Shall we paint real or nice? That's a... I'm confused by your question. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that, uh, Robert uh, or Roberto. Should we paint real or nice? I... Hmm. I have a tendency to try to paint a little bit more realistic. I'm not a big... There's some people who will paint very kind of cartoony almost and go like super high contrast and really bright colors and things like that. I like to go a little grungier. I like to think about how these people are probably walking around in the dirt and uh, and probably not clean. And so that's kind of generally um, what's going on. Oh, it looks like all you guys got skeletons yesterday. Dang it. Um, anyway, so yeah, I generally have a tendency to paint a little bit more real, which makes them a little bit harder to enjoy sometimes from a long distance. So when you look at them on the table, like some people make like to make their models look very high contrast so that when you look at them from five feet away on the table, they still stand out. But I like to look at them closer and like enjoy them a little bit more from close. So that's me. But it's totally up to you. Yeah, everybody's saying the orcs and the skeletons definitely out this weekend. Huh? All right. Well, I goofed up. Um, I'll have to get my uh, local shop in, in, in gear on that. I'd like to say hello to um, moderator Matt this morning. Glad to see him here. Uh, I saw on Instagram that you and your your significant other were hanging out at a video arcade. Uh, I was I'm jealous. It looks like it was fun. I was just looking at my Instagram feed this morning. <clears throat> Lazy Sigmarite says Space Marines or the Guard. Actually, he says Space Marines. Or the guard. Uh, I guess it. For frankly, it depends on what you like. Um, and to be fair, why not both? You know, I mean, really, you can certainly take a detachment of Space Marines and a detachment of Guard. My overall plan for my Space Marines is to eventually have a fifteen hundred point detachment of Space Marines, and then add a thousand point detachment of uh, Adeptus Mechanicus with a Imperial Knight, and then I'll be able to run a twenty five hundred point list. Um, that's like the, the the high end. I don't really ever see myself going much bigger than that. But that's that's something you can do. You know, you could go some Space Marines and some Guard, just the way that the army works. You know, you'd need to keep them in separate detachments to get the best um, synergy and whatnot. You know, um, technically, if you want to play totally unbound, you can just mix whatever the heck you want together. But if you're trying to play a little bit more by the rules, yeah, you could easily run. Because they both have the Imperium keyword, you could easily run them together and, and just make them two separate detachments. So, um, also depends on whether you want to paint a lot of vehicles or a lot of dudes or, you know, there's a lot of different things. Hmm. Nice paint would look like it came off the assembly line. Real would have rust, dirt, and grime. Oh, well, then I'd be real. Totally. Um, yeah, I always paint stuff to look used to look worn i don't i mean well because partially i don't paint you know elves or other magical type creatures you i would always assume that like an elfin lord or a, an elfin lady or whatever would always look like they just stepped out of the shower no matter what kind of grime they were sitting in you know it'd be like from uh from lord of the rings when everyone's slogging through the snow and legolas is walking across the top of it you know it's that kind of stuff and since i don't play or paint really kind of any elves i don't ever you know go that direction um everything else because i'm it's a war game i always think of it being in the war and being dirty and grungy and you know so that's just always kind of the way i do it even with space marines who a lot of people will say that they spend all their time polishing their armor um i because they're on the board when I'm playing with them, I think of them as being, well, now they're there, and now they're dirty at the very least. So that's the kind of the way I like to do it. Adam says, I like Mantic. I got into Dead Ball, or Dread Ball, and Dead Zone. Uh, this is maybe the second time I've heard about Star Saga. Oh, well, I mean, it was a Kickstarter, and, um, you know, they haven't really talked a ton about it since the Kickstarter, I guess, because it's not out and available in stores. Once it's out and available in stores and on their website, then they'll probably start making all kinds of expansions like they did for Dungeon Saga. And then, you know, you'll probably most, most likely start hearing uh, more about it. Uh, let's see here. I have a question. With some moderates delivering and some purchases all arriving at the same time, any tips for working through a queue that can, be, that can seem overwhelming? Um, 
I just like to prioritize. Um, right now, my queue for building and everything like that is I'm trying to get my um, I'm trying to get my Space Marine Army to 1,500 points painted. My Chaos Space Marine Army is at 1,500 points painted, and I played several games with it when I was at uh, Valhalla. It was great. I haven't played a game since I got home uh, of 40k yet, though. Um, but I have a, a few more models to tack onto that army to make it to 2,000 points, and those are in progress. Uh, so I've got them like partially painted, or I've got them really primed, built and primed and all that stuff. But they're now a little bit further back on the priority because now I'm trying to get my Space Marines to 1,500 points. And partially the reason for that is because then if I really want to, if I want to teach somebody 40K, I can bring two 1,500-point armies and then you know teach somebody 40K or play with a friend who just doesn't have the stuff yet or is working on it or whatever, that kind of thing. So that's my priority. Then going beyond that and getting into up to 2,000 points, at that point, probably after getting my 1,500 points of Space Marines done, I may then go back to Chaos, finish up that last 500 points to get it to 2,000 points, then go back to Space Marines again and finish up the last bit to get it to 2,000 points, and then we work on AdMac or something like that or whatever. You guys don't necessarily need to know what my schedule is because uh, it's not super interesting, but prioritizing, I think, just even writing it down on paper or putting it into a, like a file on your phone, you know, some sort of notepad thing and just being like, this is what I want to get done. And the trick is to not let yourself just constantly like, oh, something new came out and grab it and throw it in there. Now, I'm not necessarily taking my own advice right now because I am building, I picked it up yesterday, I am building a Redemptor Dreadnought for my Space Marines, which will not fit into the 1500 point um, list, but it will fit into the um, 2000 point list. So I think it's more of a, I want to get it built and then I'll paint 1500 points, go back to Space Marines, then go back. But again, I may call an audible and change it a little bit and just decide I might as well take my Space Marines to 2000 and then go back to my Chaos Space Marines. I'm not sure, but if you stick to uh, mostly a kind of, uh, you know, a priority list, you can do pretty well. And if you need to change the priority list, priorities change. It's the way it works. So, you know, does that. <clears throat> Good morning from Argentina. Well, hello. Hey, Adam, can I cosplay as my models while wargaming, or is that just creepy? Uh, I guess it depends on your models a little bit. You know, like, if you get all dressed up as Dark Eldar, people are going to be a little spooked out, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a big cosplayer. It totally, you know, it's up to you. Now, if you want to cosplay, uh, and this is sort of a weird transition, if you do want to cosplay while playing 40k, what you want to do then is you want to get yourself to uh, Schaumburg, Illinois, in uh, March of this upcoming year, and get yourself to Adepticon. So uh, Adepticon is, I've talked about it a bunch of times before, huge, probably 4,000 people showing up, uh, miniatures convention, just basically wargaming. And uh, it takes place in a, a, it's four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's the best convention, in my opinion, of any kind, <laughs> ever. Um, I'm maybe a little, you know, slanted on that, but that's the way I look at it. And uh, they have a team tournament for 40K, and one of the things you get judged on is costumes. Now, you don't have to cosplay, per se. You may all just have matching shirts, because you're, like, on the same team. Uh, or you may have matching hats, or you all may dress in togas, or whatever. It's crazy. The team tournament is crazy for um, Adepticon, and it's always very well uh, attended, and it's always full. Um, so that might be something to think about. That all being said, partially why I'm bringing this up is because they just, I want to say yesterday, opened up, not ticket sales, but they've opened up the event list for 2018 Adepticon, the Adepticon coming up in March. They've opened up the preliminary event list so that you can see all the events that have been scheduled and then you can kind of get stuff figured out. And it will be late November when they open up ticket sales and event signups and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you could go look at the Adepticon list, which is at adepticon.org, O-R-G. Um, and you can find out right now uh, like what kind of events are going on and you can go from there. I, uh, I am going to have two seminars this year. At Adepticon, I will have a seminar on Thursday and a seminar on Friday that I'll be teaching, and they will be about YouTubery. Um, one will be about the technical stuff, like you know, like cameras and microphones and 
editing software and all kinds of junk like that. And then the second one, the one on Friday, will be more about branding, like stuff like that thing, uh, and strategy and social marketing and all kinds of junk like that. So if you're interested uh, and you're going to be an Adepticon or if you're or planning on being an Adepticon, but boy, oh boy, now you're interested because you want to watch you know, my seminars, um, take a look at the Adepticon.org website and uh, you'll be able to sign up and go from there. Like I said, it's the best uh, convention. I know I've met some of you there. Definitely 12 Neef. I know we've, we've, we've talked at Adepticon. Um, so I'm trying to think if I have seen anybody else in the list here that I recognize, but I don't. But definitely, yeah, it's a great, it's a super great convention. If you get a chance at some point in your life, you got to try to make it to Adepticon. It is the pilgrimage. Like I said before, Gen Con's great, but it's only great if you're into more than just wargaming. Like if you're into RPGs heavy and also wargaming, awesome. But if you're just really mainly into wargaming, like myself, definitely Adepticon is awesome. Plus you'll be able to hang out with me and Matt maybe. I don't know. At least see us, you know. We'll be there. Um, Randall asks, are you doing an Adepticon meetup? Uh, yeah, that's definitely the plan. I did a meetup during Gen Con this year at a sandwich shop near the convention center. Uh, it's the sandwich shop that I just can't stop myself from eating at uh, pretty much all the time. Well, luckily, there's not one here in town, or I would be twice as large as I am now. So, uh, yeah, I would... Um, yeah, I'm planning on having something. I don't have anything set up, set up yet, but there's going to be a meetup, so that'll be fun. And it's a... The thing is, too, about, you know, like, Gen Con is 60,000 people. Uh, Adepticon's like 4,000, and it's all in one building. It's a really big building, don't get me wrong, but it's predominantly all held in one building. So meetups are a little bit easier, um, you know, and plus you just bump into people a lot because it's a smaller convention, but it's still... You know, it's a big convention, but in comparison to the giant, you know, Gen Con, it's, it's smaller. It's a lot of fun. Matthew Sears and I, uh, moderator Matt and I, originally met at uh, Adepticon. That's true. He just posted that. Um, I was, at the time, working for Beasts of War. I was the United States correspondent for Beasts of War from 2010 to 2013, roughly. Uh, now it's the job that um, uh, Dawn and Gianna do, uh, and do very well, by the way. Um, anyway, so I was tasked, I want to say it was maybe 2011? 2011 or 2012, I was tasked with interviewing these guys who had this game, this post-apocalyptic game called Wreckage, and so that's where I originally met Matt and Anton, and so, yeah, that's, so you can meet all kinds of people at Gen Con, it's awesome, or sorry, Adepticon, you meet people at Gen Con too, but Adepticon, all right, uh, Voing, I'm not even getting that anywhere near right. I already asked my boss to send me to Chicago HQ on Adepticon same week. Let's see if I can manage to get there finally. Well, that's a good idea. If you can get work to send you there, and then you can just take some time off and go and have some fun at Adepticon, that's 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 a good idea. All right. Torben says, another Star Saga backer here. Looking forward to, to see what we'll be getting soon. Absolutely. I'll be opening it uh, pretty soon. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm good. Just looking at the time. Thinking about going to Adepticon this year, how tough is it to get a hotel room? Well, if you want to get a hotel room in the main hotel at this point, it's very tough because I'm pretty sure they're all sold out. That being said, there are several hotels that are within not very far walking distance. Now, I'm not talking about like across the street. You know, you're still talking about maybe a ways, but it's not very far. There are a, a, a hotels around Adepticon, and if you look on the Adepticon website, I think, in housing or whatever, they list a bunch of them. And you should still be able to probably get some hotel rooms in some of those places. And again, you'll just be having to walk back and forth a little bit, but not too bad. Um, there's a bunch of hotels in that area. So if you want to be in the main hotel and just stay in that hotel, you really have to jump on it. Like, they announced it. I was at work, and I happened to have... Um, Facebook open and I just was flipping through and then I saw this post from the Adepticon. I follow Adepticon on Facebook and it said it was like three minutes ago and it said, Oh hey, we opened up the hotel blocks and I immediately just and just got my hotel room because they go they do go pretty quick, the ones in the main hotel. But like I said, there's other stuff around um, that you can just kind of go to and it's it, it works out nicely. It's it's a great little convention. Um, I mean it's not that little, but it's in comparison to like big conventions, it's a little which is strange. But um, it's also relatively inexpensive, really. Uh, like, if you just 
want to, let's say you live nearby and you just want to kind of gauge it and figure out what you want, you know, if it's interesting or not. Let's say you lived 45 minutes away, you could just drive there and walk around in the convention and look around and they're not going to charge you to walk around and look. Like, unlike Gen Con, where, like, if you want to go into the dealer area, you have to have a badge and there's, like, a, a security guard who's watching everybody. Here, they're like, well, if you come in and buy stuff from vendors, that makes vendors happy and we're not going to charge you $30 just so you could buy something from a vendor because then you'll spend less with vendors. Now, if you want to play in a tournament or be in an event and all that kind of stuff, then you got to buy a ticket. But the tickets are only 30 bucks for all four days. Um, now, you can pay more to get what's known as the swag bag, and I think that's like 50 or $55. And then you get um, a bunch of free stuff along with your ticket. Uh, and then I think there's even a VIG, which is like the very important gamer, which you pay a lot more and you get a much bigger swag bag and it's a whole deal. But um, but yeah, so it's if it's it's just a great, if you just want to come by and check it because you live sort of nearby, you can come and check it for the day. And again, it's not going to cost you anything as far as getting in. Now, if you're coming from a longer distance, yeah, like I said, you're going to want to at least get the $30 ticket um, and then you'll be able to play in events. And most of the events generally have a cost as well so it's not like you pay thirty dollars and then you get you know a free ride but you can play in all the demos and things like that usually and those are generally free um but like seminars have a cost sometimes it's relatively low sometimes it's a bit higher um depends like some seminars cost like 40 or 50 dollars but you're also getting a bunch of materials too like you're not just like going to sit there and listen to someone you're going to go in there and you're also they're going to give like okay we're going to go through all this stuff here's a bunch of paints here's a bunch of brushes and you'll be able to take those with you like i did a, a seminar two three years ago about how to paint like blood and pus and 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 wounds and gross stuff and everything like that and we got like a whole box full of stuff that we got to take with us like with um all kinds of different materials like tamaya smoky red and the uhu glue for making like saliva drippy stuff on monsters and things like that and so that was really cool but uh matthew sears says there's a hyatt regency up the street that he likes so that's a good place to go to yeah uh randall hey adam do the adepticon vip tickets cover your talks no uh vip tickets basically just give you i th you get i think maybe a t-shirt and a pint automatically i don't remember that for sure i don't know i know you get the, the big swag bag like last year there was a ton of stuff in the vip swag bag there's a ton so yeah but still all of the different um events and stuff like that are all they all have their own separate costs because the people giving the events like basically get like adepticon takes a little bit of the event cost and then the rest of it goes to the person giving the seminar you know um that kind of stuff so Uh, let me see here. What else have we got? Do people still play Wreckage? Yes, they do. Actually, I'm playing. I'm playing with uh, my friend Jason soon. Um, he played um, a couple weeks ago. He went home to like where his parents live and played with a friend of his and stuff. And we're gonna be playing again soon. I've got some buildings I need to finish, and then it'll be sweet. Uh, and the new 2.0 version of the rules is coming out for Wreckage quite soon, so that'll be a thing. Um, absolutely. What else have we got here? Let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, when is Adepticon? Uh, sometime in early March, I think. Um, I don't have it open. But yeah, it's in March. Let's see here. Bob Birdsong asks, what's your stance on 40K now? Uh, well, and by now you mean 8th edition, I'm assuming. Uh, I'm playing it again. I hadn't really played, like I played a little bit of 6th. And I played maybe one game of seventh and was unhappy kind of with the way the rules had gone. And so I stopped playing for quite some time. And now um, now I'm, I'm, I'm back into it. You know, I'm building armies and I'm playing games and I'm having a good time. Like I got just stomped at, at, at uh, Valhalla, my first game. I played against um, Owen, the cooler, uh, gaming with the cooler, if you follow his YouTube channel. Uh, and he, of course, just stepped on my neck. But I still had a good time. Uh, a partially because he's a decent guy, he's a good guy, and everything, so that's fun. But it's still, it's a. I, I'm finding that I'm enjoying it. So yeah. <clears throat> um, let me see here. I have a question. How hard was it for you to set up a tabletop minions expo? Um. Other than a miscommunication about whether or not it was going to actually happen with the people who run the the, the facility. Uh, 
it was generally relatively simple. Now, that being said, I ran a small generalist tabletop gaming convention that had board gaming and RPGs and all that kind of stuff. I ran that for 11 years before I started the channel. So every year I ran this convention basically in the same spot kind of where, where the Tabletop Minions Expo was. So I was used to knowing like what I needed. Like, you know, you got to get insurance and you got to get name tags and you got to get, you know, this and that and the other thing and a website and all that jazz. So I'd been doing it for a while. So for me to like hop back into it, it was super, for me at least, relatively simple. Like I still had a tub in the basement that still had like my cash box in it and a whole bunch of other junk that I just opened up and was like, oh yeah, I'll just repurpose this stuff. And it worked out pretty well. If you're starting from scratch on your first convention, there's some learning uh, that, that needs to come. But the fact is, is that, and this is kind of a, a motto for life for me, honestly. So you may want to write this down, everybody. Um, start small and grow slowly. I'm a big fan of that uh, kind of motto. Start small and grow slowly. So don't start your first convention and go, I expect there to be 500 people here because there won't be. It's just not going to happen. If you plan on a small kind of thing and you can do that, then great. Um, and you kind of work from there. But don't plan like it's going to be huge because then if it isn't, you might be left holding the bag on a big deposit on a big event. You know, if you can find a place to have the... Having have a place to have the event is one of the biggest portions of trying to get an, a big or get an event like that set up. So if you can find a small event that's inexpensive and start there, outgrowing an event is better than rattling it around inside of a big room. You know, if you have a convention that is twenty five hundred square feet and there are forty people there, it's going to look bad. But when you have a convention that maybe fits in a thousand square feet and the place kind of seems packed. Well, now you know you need to grow because you've gotten to that point, but don't start in a huge room and not have enough people. I guess that's a big thing. Start small, grow slowly. Audrey Keith says, Hey, Adam, did you ever get that LED mini electronic billboard terrain piece finished? It looks super cool. No. Um, the screens don't seem to work anymore, and I don't know why. And I've got a friend who's really good with electronics, and he's messing with it. He can't get it to work. Um, the company that made them is no longer seemingly in business, so I can't get new ones from them. So my friend who's good with electronics is in the process right now of trying to figure out a way for us to go through. There's this website called Alibaba where you can buy all kinds of different like electronic stuff and all kinds of stuff that's manufactured predominantly in China. Uh, and we're trying. he's trying to kind of source a uh, basically a replacement screen. So something where... We're looking for a screen that you can plug a, a, a battery and a memory card into and have it just play videos. It doesn't need to have a speaker necessarily. It'd be awesome if it did, but it doesn't have to. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, and so, unfortunately, yeah, it's not finished uh, because I can't get the piece of the, the, the thing to work. Ben asks, what is Tabletop Minions Expo? So Tabletop Minions Expo was a small little convention that I started, uh, and it was back in June. The next one will be in June of 2018, uh, 9th and 10th, I believe, but I'm not, don't hold me to that. I'm pretty sure that's right, but I don't have my phone on me. Um, so uh, it'll be in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, and it is a small convention just about wargaming. There's a couple of vendors last year, hoping they have a couple of vendors again this year. Um, and it's not a tournament. It's not anything like that. It's, um, how am I trying to say it? It's basically like we're going to sit down and we want people to bring demo games. We want people to bring games that, um, that they can teach people. We want people to bring games that they made up, homebrew games. We want people to bring stuff like that um, just to, to teach people games. Like you, We don't want you to come there and say, okay, i got to bring my army so that we can play. We want you to come there and be like, I'm going to sit down and learn about a bunch of new games and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's that's the way the Tabletop Minions Expo goes. And I'll be an, doing a full-blown announcement probably after the first of the year um, and opening up the website again and going through all that stuff. But yeah, it, um, last year there was like 65 people there, which was fun. It was a great, it's a great little place. And so it was fun. But we had people come from, uh, we had someone come from, where are we going? We, we had somebody coming, we had somebody come from Texas. Uh, the noob painter came from Texas. We had uh, Michael... Uh, Strickler, they're right down there. Yep, Michael Strickler came from um, Colorado or Wyoming, Cheyenne, Wyoming. 
yeah, over there. Uh, it was a long drive. Uh, he and his wife came and they had a good time. And uh, so, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, a, it's a fun convention. I'll be talking about it more as we get closer to it. So, yeah. Torben asks, hey, Adam, have you had a look at the Vanguard Kickstarter from Mantic? It looks really cool. I found out some stuff about it and I was interested. And it seems like they're kind of going with a cool skirmish game idea, which I'm interested in. I haven't looked at it super hard and I keep meaning to, though. Um, but it's cool. Uh, Kyle says, do rules change after an edition is released or do they stay unchanged until a new edition is released? Example, does the size, does the CZ initiative still exist or is this changed to something else? Um, in general with 40K, they will have frequently asked questions that may change things a bit. Um, a new thing, that they're well, it's a new thing recently, but they're bringing it back from in the old days. Um, 40K is going to have a book coming out eventually called Chapter Approved, which is going to be kind of like the general's handbook for age of sigmar whereas it'll have a bunch of new stuff for 40k and in that it will have rules that you can use you don't have to use them but you can um like one of the rules will be that um like right now in 40k whoever places the whoever completely places their army first when they go back and forth you know you, you place a unit i place a unit you place an unit. whoever places the you know completely places their army before their opponent does meaning they have fewer units they automatically get to go first well the new rule that's going to be in chapter approved is if you want to use it uh from what i understand you'll be able to get a bonus to the roll but there'll still be a roll off so there's different things like that um yeah so that's going to be interesting um looking forward to seeing some of that stuff but the thing is is that with chapter approved i believe just like the the general's handbook they're going to put out a new chapter approved book every year like they just recently put out the general's handbook 2017 which is the second chapter or chapter or general's handbook it basically went in that book it goes through and changes a bunch of point levels for um age of sigmar and then it also what else does it do and then it gave you a bunch of scenarios and junk like that now the old book the old points are no longer valid but all the scenarios and other cool stuff that they put in there you can still use so that's one of the benefits to holding on to your old book and not just you know pitching it in the river so there's that <clears throat> sam hinchy says alibaba is like the chinese version of amazon well sort of i mean but it's also like you can get weird strange electronic stuff and you can get it in bulk if you want to so that's kind of cool too um yeah Billboard would be a good use for outdated smartphones. Well, that'd be kind of cool. I could see that maybe. Like if you could figure, well, maybe. <clears throat> VJ Morph says, haven't seen Noob Painter in a while. That's true. Maybe he's working or something. Um, ben, hey, Adam, I have a question. What do you think about the Citadel Paint app? I love it because I can essentially make a grocery list when I go to my local game store. Um, I've messed with it, and it's cool. I have not... Um, I don't know. I haven't really, uh, like, I haven't used it as a paint uh, list to take to stores. I should go through all of my Citadel paints and put them in there, but my concern is that some of my Citadel paints are old, like, back before the name changes and stuff, so I'd be like, well, I can't put this one in because they don't have a name for it, but I haven't looked into it that closely. But it's very nice to be able to show people, like, if they're like, I want to paint orange how do i do it and then it's like oh we'll start with this base and then do this wash and then do this highlight and stuff and that's really nice i think for for starting painters to at least get that idea they can use the citadel paints absolutely or they can even look at it and go well you know i do have this one in vallejo and it's close to that so i could but at least they're understanding the the step by step and i think that's important so yeah What else have we got here? Garm says, hey, Adam, I blame you for the Mercs factions I am assembling right now. The Mercs models are really cool. I actually picked up the uh, version 2.0 book, the hardcover, recently. I got it on Amazon for sort of a good deal. It was because it was getting hard to find, and so I did grab it. Um, I don't think I have any of the plastics, and I really should because they're, from what I understand, quite nice plastics. I've always liked the Mercs designs. I've always liked the artwork. I've always liked the the modeling and everything like that. And so I do want to get some of the plastics too. Um, just, I think, because A, they're cool, and B, they are, frankly, pretty inexpensive. Like, you get a bunch of models for 35 bucks because they're plastics. So it's, and they're cool sci-fi, you know, guys with guns, which is, you can always use, even if you don't play Mercs, you can use them for something else, I suppose. <clears throat> 
John Jay says, Paint Rack is better for inventorying paints. It's Android only, though. I know. That bums me out because I'm an Apple guy, generally. And I wish that Paint Rack would be on Apple as well. I wish that um, Paint Pot app for the iOS is pretty good. I have the Paint Pot app. It's, it's okay, but I like the idea of the other one better a little bit. And I do wish... I've almost kicked around... Hmm. <laughs> I've almost kicked around the concept of just, like, the company that I work for. We should just contact those guys and go, look, it, we can do the app in iOS that you already have done in Android and it will only cost this much. But I don't know if they, I don't know that they would necessarily, I don't, I'm sure that the, the paint rack app is probably someone's side hustle. It's not their main job. So they probably don't have the money to be able to just do it. They were probably, you know, they probably were a programmer or still are a programmer and made it them, you know, in their spare time, which is what a lot of apps, smaller apps happen, you know, so we'll see how that goes. Um, VJ Morph asks, Adam, could you tell us where you get your info on upcoming tabletop related Kickstarters? Hmm. Uh, I see a lot of them on Facebook these days lately, uh, because a lot of people are advertising on Facebook, you know, to advertise their Kickstarter. So I see that a lot. Uh, tabletop gaming news. I see a bunch of them in there as well. Um, those are the main two. I don't really search the Kickstarter website to look for tabletop stuff. Um, but I do see some of it through, like I said, through Facebook which has got, you know, me obviously targeted to some degree, just like it has all of us targeted to some degree. Uh, and so there's that. And then there's, uh, like I said, the um, uh, tabletop gaming news I keep an eye on because they usually have pretty good information about that stuff too. And to some degree, Beasts of War, like in the, um, they've got a forum uh, on Beasts of War website that also a lot of people post Kickstarter stuff in. So there's that too. 12 Neef says, will you be playing at Adepticon? I'm going to bring a small mat and terrain to play Kill Team and Age of Sigmar Skirmish at Adepticon. Come and play me. Well, I might be. I mean, I'm planning on bringing... Like last year, I brought my... my I thought I brought 1,000 points of uh, Age of Sigmar, and then when I opened my case, I realized I had left many models at home and had put something else in there. Like I put... I was like... I was taking the case to show someone a bunch of paint stuff, so I had put in some 40K stuff and some Age of Sigmar stuff, and then never put the Age of Sigmar stuff back. So when I went to go to Adepticon, I just grabbed my case that all my Age of Sigmar stuff was in, which of course not all of it was. And then I got there and I was going to play with um, uh, Mitch from um, uh, MC1 Gamer. Uh, I thought about playing, we were going to get together and play a game at some point. And then I realized that I didn't have a thousand points. I had like 600 points. So um, it didn't work out, but I'm, I'm hoping to be able to bring some game, some stuff to play, um, this upcoming year. I think that'd be kind of fun. I'd like to do a little bit more of that. Like, I don't really plan, other than the two seminars that I'm giving at Adepticon, I don't know that I'm going to sign up for any other seminars or events. I'm just trying to be a little bit more fluid to be in, you know, to do some gaming, maybe. I'm going to have a meetup, obviously. Um, I'll probably having, be having some meetings with some of the companies as well, hopefully, if I can, you know, get some of that stuff scheduled. So that kind of jazz. That's kind of where it's at. I'm going to be getting there a night earlier this year. Usually I get down to Adepticon Thursday morning. Well, a little bit closer to lunch. And then, so I leave like here, and it's about a three-hour drive. So I leave here in the morning and then drive down there uh, and get there right around lunchtime. Uh, this year I'm leaving actually the night before on Wednesday because last year, Games Workshop had a big press thing where they announced Shadespire and some other stuff. And I totally missed it because I was not even there yet. So this year I'm leaving a night earlier, which means an extra ho night of hotel, room, payment, and then... Eh. But you know, anyway, it'll be fun. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. Torben asks, Hey, Adam, I've been wondering... Is this golden age for war games where we are spoiled for choice and options a benefit or a deficit to the community at large? Um, I think it's a benefit because it allows people to be able to play the type of game generally that they want because there are so many different ones to be able to... This is a very good question, by the way. Uh, there's so many different types of games to be able to play. Um... You know, there are some people who just want to play whatever is most popular so they can find the most opponents. Uh, so uh, there's obviously a lot of choice even just within Games Workshop these days because they're one of the most popular. Um, if you want something that's maybe about as popular but not quite, but you can still find opponents in certain different pockets of the country slash world, you know, then you're going to go private your press because you're going to play War Machine and Hordes. Um, 
or you're going to play uh, X-Wing because you don't want to paint, maybe, but you still want to have a good time and even play competitively, that kind of stuff. That's cool. Um, and eventually over time, maybe you start painting your, you know, Millennium Falcons or whatever, and then eventually you're full-blown, you're full you know, Wargamer with painting stuff and you've got glue on your fingers and all that stuff. Like, you know, me. I don't... I probably had some glue on my fingers from last night. Anyway, there are some people who that I know of who are like, I don't like the fact that there are so many games because now I have a hard time finding people to play with because, you know, like, like they're like, hey, you want to get together and play this? No, I don't play that. I play this. And, you know, it's, I used to be way more into PC gaming than I am now. And I used to run a, a LAN party. And when we first started running the LAN party, everybody was playing the same game. Now, admittedly, it was because it was a smaller LAN party. We only had like a dozen people. So you could all fit into one server. But we were all playing the big, you know, new hotness or whatever. Well, eventually, our LAN party grew to, I think the biggest number we ever had for people at our LAN party was 98 attendees. And so by this point, we had been renting a, a hall and we've been running power and doing it. Was a, it we've been going for years on this. We were doing it once a quarter. And so, yeah, we, you know, we had 98 people of 10. Well, 98 people couldn't even fit into the same server back then. This was 2002, 2003. Um, and, you know, you would go and walk around and everybody would be there having a good time, but only, like, these guys would be playing in this game and, you know, there would be tons of different games going on. So the whole concept of, like, oh, we're all playing one game and we're all having a great time sort of went away. But you could also meet some guys by walking around who you didn't know, but they were playing the same game that you like that's very specific, and then you might start playing with them, and then, then you become friends, and then eventually... You start dating or, or you become someone's best man or whatever the deal is, you know, whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's how it kind of works. I think these days having tons of choices out there is great. And you can still go with the big choices if you want to because you want to find have an easier time finding um, opponents. But you can also go with the smaller choices because there are so many more smaller choices out there to choose from. And it may require that you build two forces so that you can get your friend to play even though they don't have anything and you might convince them and eventually get them to start playing but you're not going to go to like a big tournament for some small game but i don't know i i prefer personally the fact that there are small game companies out there who can do cool and interesting stuff um but you can also still like i play very small games i play wreckage which is a company that is matt and anton it's and john so it's three technically three people um but I also play 40K, which is the biggest game out there. So there's no reason you can't do both of those things, in my opinion. And having the choice to be able to do those, in my opinion, is a good idea. Your mileage may vary, but that's my answer. Again, it depends. Um, Ralph Hummel asks, did you notice that you can get most Black Library audiobooks on Audible too? I did just actually buy some uh, Audible because uh, I had I, I, Audible as a service where you pay a monthly fee and they give you these credits and then you can use credits to buy um, audiobooks from their huge library. For a long time, Games Workshop books like the Black Library books were not in Audible because they were making their own audiobooks, thank you very much, and they didn't want to give any money to Audible. And now with the new leadership, they understand, oh, yeah, no, we could actually sell a ton more books if we would also you know, maybe give some shekels to the company that does it and spreads it out all over the world versus getting people to only come to Black Library to find our audiobooks. So um, I have picked up a couple. Now, I don't know that it's most. I think that they've just started, but I think eventually it will be most, so that'll be cool. But yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to... Like, I know that the Eisenhorn books and the Ravnor books, which are the two books about... or the two series of books about two different um, Inquisitors, which are some of my favorite Black Library stuff, those are in there. So that's really cool, um, definitely. Uh, Mario says, recently ordered my first 3D printer and interested to hear more of your thoughts on the topic. I'll be doing a new video about 3D printing very soon. I'm going to be talking about um, 3D design software. It's a piece of software that I've been using that I really like, um, and it's free. So um, uh, that's people like that generally. So I'm going to be doing that soon. That's actually videos coming up in the next month or maybe even quicker. We'll see how that goes. Melanie Dawn says, I have glue on my fingers right now as I assemble my anvil stuff. Yeah, that's I all the time. I'm, anytime I'm gluing anything, it's going to end up on my fingers. I don't know how that works, but it does. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. All right, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start talking about... 
nope, wrong side. That, Star Saga. And I'm going to open the box so we can start doing the unboxing because it's about an hour into the show. So we're going to go here to Cam 2. Well, all right. So this is my Switchblade, which I will be using to do the thing to open the box. It will be probably easier to open it over here. All right. So the box is covered in plastic. Strange, I know. All right. There. Okay, just close up this knife. Set it over here. Doesn't smell weird, so that's good. All right, plastic over there, which I'm sure cats will find very soon. So here's the box. Now it is no longer shiny. I'm gonna have to move some things here. I'm not gonna try to spill my coffee because I'm not doing that today. So Put the box over here, and we'll go to cam two. All right, so there's the corner of the box. I'm going to try to lift the box and get it open. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is a bigger box than I had thought. I'm going to have to try to move this light back. There we go. A little, that will help. All right, so here's a box. It's got a cool plastic... Um, what do you call this? Like a divider thingy, which is very nice. There are uh, these big sized cards here. So like, like, I don't know, in comparison to my head, I don't know, it's a big card. Like this deck of cards here seems to me to be general playing card size. Um, these little skill cards are quite tiny. These remind me of the size of cards in X-Wing, like the little ones, like the, the damage cards or the add-on cards. These are about roughly that size. You get a deck of those. I don't know, maybe 50-ish. Um, this is a little bit more. This is a, a bunch of different cards. Like I said, these are just standard size uh, cards. And then there's these uh, character cards, which are quite large. These are probably three by fives inches roughly. They come in little plastic sealable um, pouches here. Like I can just, you know, take them out, put them back in, which is nice. So that's like a nice little sticky thing here. So I can put them in there and it's a little envelope, which is really nice because these are a big weird size and then being able to keep them in there in between games and reseal it very easily is nice. These, I'm pretty sure because they're just shrink wrapped, you're going to pretty much open these up and then store them in here. These, oh, look at that. See, these fit. Okay, that's cool. So you've got the little skill cards here. You've got the bigger kind of ne Nexus cards. I don't know if there's other different names for those. And then you've got this overall slot that goes over that area that these big character cards go into. So that's a nice, um, what do you call it, a uh, economy of, uh, of shape. We've got a plastic baggie of a bunch of red guys. Okay, so these are soldiers of some flavor. We have another baggie of red guys. Uh, kind of a nice thing, none of these guys need to be built. These guys are already assembled, so that's really kind of nice. So, a bunch of different red guys, soldiery type dudes. All right, what do we got over here? Here's a bag of blue people. Um, again, well, I was going to say that doesn't, so this is, this seems like a more brittle plastic. If you can just hear from the sound difference, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so blue guys, these I think are your more good guys because you've got um, a lot of, uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. There's like a base in there that's just by itself and there's nobody attached to it. So, that's interesting. Um, oh, it's for this gun. Okay, so there's a little bit of gluing that you are probably going to have to do on some of these, but most of them are put together by, by one piece. Um, let's see here. Even more red guys. Another bag of red guys. Another bag of blue guys. Ooh, wow. So, like, this guy. I mean, he's pretty... It's like a big scary uh, alien with lots of tentacles and stuff like that. Kind of looks like the thing 
and I don't mean like the Fantastic Four thing, but like the movie thing, you know, a little bit. Uh, we got a big old bag of dice here, custom dice in red and blue, with shields and a bunch of other stuff on there. That's fun. And then over here we've got. Now this guy's probably going to have to be built. He is one of the big monster plague guys or whatever. Uh, what do we got else over here? Over here is a big bag of furniture and doors and a whole bunch of other junk. Um, which I'm going to go through this stuff. I'm not just going to show you a bunch of close-ups of bags. But, you know, I just wanted to go through initially what's in the box when you open it. Um, and I'm betting, if I was a betting man, I would say that underneath this cool plastic tray is where all of the tiles and all the other jazz is. Hey, look, I was right. So, in the bottom of the box, under the cool plastic tray... Oh, actually, that other bag is just... Where'd it go? This bag is just evidently furniture. So, lots and lots of cool sci-fi furniture and junk. This bag is just doors. Bulkhead doors and stuff like that, which is also pretty cool. Here, we have our instructions. This is the... Well, actually, it's not the instructions. This is the mission book. Uh that comes along in there and it is a saddle stitched uh, pretty thin little book but full color on the inside lots of cool photography and whatnot and it's going to have all the different missions in it over here we have the main rule book which is also again pretty thin saddle stitched kind of reminds me of a comic book um, as far as format and size it's kind of tall and skinny and again probably full color hey look at that yep so You've got all the instructions in here for everything that you're going to need to play the game and all the parts that come with it. So, geez, mercenary counters, locked door counters, mercenaries, bosses, cabinets, tables, corporation rangers, lab technicians. I mean, there's a ton of junk in here. Both of those are basically like comic book size. And then, like as far as thickness and actual format. And then we've got, let's see here, we've got a bunch of punch-out parts. So there's a lot of tokens, and um, looks like some floor tiles over here. We've got some range rulers, it looks like. And these are double-sided. they got stuff going on on both sides. And I'm trying not to knock all the pieces out, because they're in there. Like, I really hate it sometimes when, when stuff is perforated, and it's still really hard to get out, and you end up tearing it up when you're getting it out of there. These like have started to come out a little bit in my hand, so we're not going to have that problem with this stuff. Um, and then down here, you can notice this is just a whole bunch more floors and tiles. And there's another one of those floors and tiles cards, and a big flame template, which is fun. Um, that was just one that I grabbed, and again, double-sided. And then one more. So, and these are some bigger, like, that's a, this is a big... This is probably almost, this is f like a five inch or six inch square. That's a big one. There's a lot of different stuff going on in there. So there's one, two, three things of tiles. Well, technically four, although mostly this one is predominantly tokens, but there are some tiles in there. You've got your rule book which, like I said, is like a thick comic book. This one's... Uh, I don't have any place to set this. Really. Should have thought ahead a little bit. Um, this booklet is 32 pages, the rule booklet. The mission booklet is 40 pages, so even thicker. And then um, the doors go back in there, and then this whole plastic doohickey goes on top. and such excuse me <clears throat> all right so let me get this out of the way a little bit and then we'll try to yeah I should have planned a little bit further ahead on where to set this when I was going through it okay cool so We've got ourselves some models. 
Now, I'm noticing there's a little bit of uh, bendy knife slash bendy sword syndrome, but you're going to get that with plastic models that are pre-built, generally. If they're not on a sprue, you're going to get that a little bit. Like, the plastic is not soft. It's not as hard as, say, Games Workshop stuff or anything else that comes on a sprue. But it's not, like... It's nowhere near hero clicks bendy. <laughs> um, it's not really bendy much at all. Like it's got pretty decent detail, you know. And um, this guy's got a gun, and he's like talking on a comm. It looks like, um, but yeah, like like I said, this guy's got a bendy knife. But probably just with some hot water from the microwave or whatever in a mug, you can straighten that right back out. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever known that trick. If you've got a bent piece of plastic especially these types of models that are just a little bit softer than the hard plastic that you see for, like like I said, model airplanes or Games Workshop stuff or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you can just superheat, some, not superheat, you just, you know, boil some water in the microwave in a mug and then take the thing, be careful not to burn yourself, and just dip it in there and it will usually then straighten out and then you put it into another mug that's got cold water in it and it will harden it up in that position and it will stay generally pretty well. Um, like, this guy's got, like, a cool baton thing for smacking dudes, and that's not bent. Or is that a... That might be a lady. Oh, got a ponytail, so it's hard to say. I think it's maybe a lady. Um, but, yeah. So, and again, this thing is not focusing super hot. But it's, yeah, it's good to... You know, it's good pieces, I think. Um, and like I said, there's a bunch. Just a bunch. Because there's that bag of six. There's another bag of six. Six. These guys are bigger. Oh, I wonder if these guys are enforcers and these guys are just regular. I don't know. These guys are huge. Like some of these dudes are quite large. Alrighty. Oh no. I'm sorry. These guys are plague. Because that's guys that guy's barefoot. So yeah, he's like a big, huge rage zombie who's gotten quite large. Um and uh yeah. So that's cool. Um, what else? And then the blue guys. Like I said, some of these, one of them sounds like it's slightly more brittle plastic, and I bet you it might be that robot guy. And there's some extra pieces in there. So I don't know if I want to open this up right away, because otherwise I'm going to lose some of these really tiny pieces. But there's a couple little tiny pieces in there, which I think you glue them onto this extra base, and you glue the gun onto that base and kind of go from there. But... Um, yeah, so you got the blue plastic parts. Over here you got, like I said, big tentacly alien, which you're probably going to have to maybe rebend some of his stuff. But you've got a bunch of other parts too. Got some. That's definitely an enforcer. Um, this guy's humongous. I don't even think this guy has a base. I think this guy's just just walking around. Like, he's a big abomination, big plague abomination, I'm pretty sure. For my Dead Zone uh, set, I painted up the plague and the enforcers, and yeah, I like the big abomination guys. So this guy's pretty, he's rough business. You don't want to meet that guy in a big alley, you know, or in a, a dark alley. And yeah, he doesn't need a base. He just, he's like a gorilla. You know, he's on his knuckles there and his back feet, and he's just, he's good to go. So yeah, that's cool. I like that model a lot. I will probably paint that one up, definitely. The thing is, is that like a lot of these gateway games, they are designed it to... You can paint them up, certainly, but you don't have to. Like, they've started doing that. Like, Shadespire, the plastics that come in Shadespire, you know, the um, the uh, Stormcast Eternals are in blue plastic and the Blood Reavers are in red plastic. Now, you can paint them up, certainly, but if you don't paint them up, you can just kind of go to town, you know, with them. And at least you can tell them apart, you know, just by looking at the board and knowing who's who without having to really look at the board and go, is that a good guy or a bad guy? You know, the colors do do the job. Uh, the Death Guard, or the not Death Guard, sorry, the Skeleton Guys, um, Sepulchral Guard that's come out, they are in a bone-colored plastic. And the Orcs are in a green-colored plastic, in case you hadn't guessed. So um, it makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, and again, you can paint them, but if you don't want to, or if you don't want to right away, you want to, let's say it's Christmas morning and you get a copy of Shadespire and you want to start playing, boom, you start playing. It's easy. The pieces are fit together, um, and you're ready to go. In this situation, the pieces aren't even fit together. They're basically already together. You know, you've got models and you can start playing. There's a couple of them that you maybe want to stick together, 
but a lot of them either don't require a base or they're already built in. Like I said, they're not bendy, bendy plastic. Like they're a little bendy. You can bend any plastic if you, if you squeeze hard enough on it, but they're nowhere near um, like, uh, well, they're certainly not anything like Hero Clicks. I'm trying to think what's another one. I would say they're even less bendy than say like um, X-Wing. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's that's pretty good. That's good plastic. Um, oh, good Ziploc bag full of. Uh, I don't have to cut. Don't have to cut this one open. So yeah, this is all furniture. And again, some of this is a little bendier. This stuff is this. I would say this plastic is bendier than the guys. So these guys, you know, are a harder plastic. This is chunkier stuff, but it's not that hard to bend it with your finger. These again, still not. Hero clicks, you know, which hero clicks are nearly rubber, really. But um, this is like a guy's desk or something. I don't know. Yeah, so like here's a desk, which I'm assuming you get cover from. You know, that's pretty cool. Uh, what else have we got here? We've got some sort of computer panel. And again, yeah, these are definitely a bendier plastic. So there's that. Um, you will probably, with some of this stuff, want to go through and. Uh, what is that? Uh, you, like again, do the trick with the hot. Like yeah, see that's that's pretty bent. You know these are I think not supposed to be bent like that. This table does not currently stand up very easily, so you probably have to go through and do some of the bending because they're you know they're shipping all this stuff in this relatively small bag. So I think that's where you're going to have to go with some of these things because these are definitely a much bendier kind of plastic, um, especially at this end. You know these legs, these table legs. It's supposed to be like a desk. Guy can hide behind this desk, some somewhat or whatever, or you know, do some work, some paperwork. I think there's maybe like this, you know, there's a there's a part in the game where you have to do some paperwork, uh, not really, but um, yeah, this uh, this stuff is a lot bendier, so you're gonna want to probably do that thing where you heat up some water, straighten the stuff out, and then put it in the the cool water to to um, kind of lock it into the way it is or the way that you've 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 moved it. Like I wouldn't use a, I certainly wouldn't use a heat gun. I've tried that before. And not only is it difficult because it's hard on your fingers, it also, you can melt the plastic, which you don't want to do. So hot water is a better idea. Um, let's see here. Let's take a look at some of these cards with the different people. Okay, so like I said, here's the big cards. And they come in a nice little resealable envelope, plastic envelope package. All right, so we've got Captain Erica Dolinsky. And there's stats, and I'm sure that this is a, like, this is here, I'm sure um, you're taking damage. You know, like, take damage, take damage, and there's a counter, there's counters in those um, tiles where you're punching out and putting down stuff, and then you're taking damage, and it's getting worse, and then you croak, most likely. Um, laser assault rifle, ranged weapon, long. And then we've got uh, Wrath, who I know I've seen this character before, if I can get it in the shot. I know I've seen this character before in... Warpath, I want to say, because this is all taking place in the Warpath universe. Uh, Mantic has got their own uh, fantasy universe, which I believe is called Mantica, and then they have the Warpath universe, which is their sci-fi game, um, and they've got a fire team game, which is kind of like skirmishy version, and the big Warpath game is like large you know, groups of models, and now this is in the same universe, but it is now more like Dungeon Saga, where it's basically a, a dungeon crawl for, back, for lack of a better term. Um... There's our big aberration dude. You can see him right there. Huh? Look at that. Uh, what else we got? Enforcer, com Commandante, uh, Monarch. And we've got a Francesco the Devil Selvaggio. That guy looks bad. He's, he's, he's probably a bad guy. And there's lots of information and stats and all kinds of information down here beyond that. Here we've got a robot named Kirby. Uh, Dr. Lucas... Coyer evidently has lots of robot arms because he's like, you know, I just don't want to only have the two arms. I want to go a little bit further. Uh, organic data storage unit. I guess, okay. I thought he was an alien, but he's evidently an organic data storage unit. We've got kind of a space dwarf. Um, this guy is named Elise, I think. Um, got more a guard commander, and we're back to Captain Erica. So these are the big main cards for the players and things like that and uh, I think that's going to be kind of cool so 
And I'm going to try to put them back into the plastic sleeve. And they work just fine. And I can reseal it, and your cards are not going to get wrecked riding around inside the box. So yeah, um, there's a lot of parts in this box. There's a lot of figures, there's a lot of plastic bags full of people and whatever. I'm going to put this guy back in here for now. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the amount of figures you get in there. And like I said, you know, some of them are a little bendy. The, the terrain or the, whatever, the furniture and stuff is pretty bendy, but you know, you take the pieces you want to use, you go get yourself a couple of mugs of water, you microwave one of them. I've done it before with other models. It's a necessity in, in, in a lot of plastics when they are not on a sprue. When you when everything's on a sprue, it's a much harder plastic, plus the sprue kind of protects it in transit. These, The benefit to these is that they're already put together, and I can just start playing right away, and that's awesome. But the downside then is, is that sometimes the bendiness happens, and you kind of have to fix that. Um, how do we get it all in here? This is... All right, so I'm going to put these guys back in, and I'm going to go back to this camera here. So anyway, um, this is all the stuff that comes in the uh, Star Saga box. And uh, like I said, it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things going on in there. Rule book um, and also mission book, which if you've played other games like this, if you've played... Whoop, dropped one. If you've played um, even stuff like Space Hulk, you've got like a rule book and a mission book generally. And then you go through and you play it, and you can set up all the tiles differently and go through all that. And just, you know, it's it's a fun kind of system that way to be able to play. And it's, I think, like I said, I, I harp about gateway games all the time, but I think that they're important. And I think a gateway game like this would be great, especially if you're trying to, to get people into um, wargaming, you know, that maybe are more board gamers. You can say, well, it's like a board game, and you can set the board. And they're like, okay, I get that. That's a board. And then you say, and then you do this, and... And eventually they start understanding the concept of line of fire or line of sight, um, range. Um, a lot of the stuff that you and I think about all the time when we're playing war games, stuff that regular types of gamers, RPG people, CCG people, board gamers don't generally think about. So anyway, that's where that's at. And uh, what time is it? Okay, so it's 10, 17. Awesome. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's the unboxing. Um, I have been kind of ignoring the chat because I've been going through doing this stuff. So if you guys have got any questions, feel free to let me know. I see a lot of people talking about 40% uh, off coupons at uh, Michael's, which is a, a place that um, it's a in America. It's a it's a, like a craft store, you know. Um, but they do have lots of things that are hobby related too. Like if you were a painter who was into painting. Like fine art, things like that. They do have oil paintings and, and canvas and, and they have stuff like that. And a lot of hobbyists in our kind of realm also like to go to Michael's. Just like they go to Hobby Lobby um, as well to some degree. Like Hobby Lobby is also starting to sell like Vallejo paints. Not a bunch. Um, I bought my airbrush at, at Hobby Lobby. Uh, they sell that same type of stuff at Michael's as well. So um, I did a video a number of years ago about how, about how you should man up and go to the craft store. Um, which, you know, is it's kind of a silly way to say it. But the, the idea that going to a craft store as opposed to going to your local hobby store, like you can get a lot of the same stuff. You can get really nice brushes at a craft store and you don't necessarily have to pay sometimes as much as you do at a hobby store. So, you know, that kind of thing. Jay Thomas says, Should I paint my Shadespire skeletons the same as the rest of my Death Army or something different? Well... The trick is, is if you do paint them the, the same color as the rest of your Death Army, there are, from what I understand, free War Scrolls available for all the Shadespire miniatures to be able to use them in Age of Sigmar. So if you want to be able to use them in your Age of Sigmar army, then you may want to do that. But I would take a look at the War Scrolls first and see what you think, because maybe the War Scrolls say that those Sepatural, Sepatural which I can't say, Sepatural Guard guys, uh, skeletons, it, maybe they have some special ability or something that's really crazy cool or whatever, and then you may want to paint them different just to sort of differentiate them. Although they're they're really cool bases with all the super neat modeled stuff going on that they do, uh, should it probably help to you know at least separate them from the rest of your skeletons. But I would take a look at that. There are, um, like I said, some 
definite uh there's there's the war scrolls that are being released for all of these figures in shade spire so you can also use them in age of sigmar which is just part of the deal you know they want to do um you know they, they want people to get into shade spire and then if you look in the shade spire box like i like i showed when i did the unboxing it has a thing in there and it's like oh yeah by the way there's this game called age of sigmar which you might also like if you like shade spire and it's got lots of models and they're really cool and here's some pictures and you know it's uh that's how they're trying to do it uh, Uncle Adam, how bendy are they compared to Reaper Bones? Oh God, not even close. I mean, Reaper Bones are really bendy. Like Reaper Bones are, I should really build like a chart. Like at the worst are hero clicks. Like those are just about rubber. Reaper Bones are next. And then you go a couple more steps. And the bendiest of the stuff that's in this box, like the terrain, the terrain is closer to Reaper Bones. But all of the figures and stuff like that are a good deal further away from Reaper Bones, as far as bendiness is concerned. There should be a special bendiness scale, you know, like like there's a pain scale, like when they ask you how much pain you have, and there's like a certain scale or thing like that. It should there should be a bendiness scale for us hobbyists. Douglas Hooker says one of them looks like a race from the Mass Effect games. Um, I'm going to say maybe that Wrath person sort of reminds me because I know what you're talking about. I played the first Mass Effect. I can see what you're talking about there. The Mass Effect person had like a big sort of circular thing on their face and this person doesn't, but it's the same sort of maybe helmet with a hood kind of a little bit, or at least along the same lines. Are you going to get Necromunda when it comes out and hi from the UK? Uh, John Harrison, hello from, from America. Uh, yes, I am actually, I, I mentioned it earlier in the show, um, I believe, I think our furnace just kicked in, which it should not have. Um, um, I believe that I'm going to be getting a copy of Necromunda um, actually next week. So that should be cool. Um, I've been working with um, somebody there and they've been saying that uh, we, you know, that they're going to send me a copy. So, um, well, that's weird. Anyway, I'm not sure what that noise is right now. It might be the refrigerator, which means maybe the refrigerator is dying because it's being really loud. Um, Let's see. Sepultural Guard, according to VJ Morph. I'll probably get that wrong again, though. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Joel Stark says, finally made a live stream watching from Northern Canada. Hello, Joel. Um, let's see here. Did you celebrate Halloween, Adam? Uh, no, not particularly. I, I like Halloween, but we didn't like have the place open up and you know we didn't have kids and with you know giving out candy we uh, actually my wife and I sat and we ate pizza and we watched Stranger Things uh, which we had not caught any of season two yet so we watched the first like four episodes so that was good <clears throat> let me see what else have we got I found some cool basing material at Michael's Adam yeah I mean there's there's I, I know that there's like a couple different pumice paints that uh, some of the regular paint companies put out like Liquitex and stuff like that so I could see that that's pretty cool uh, Nuada Prime says Hero Clicks wasn't always bendier than Bones Hero Clicks varies greatly by set oh that's interesting because I've always noticed that it's well everyone that I've seen and you're right I haven't really messed with a lot of this stuff um, I haven't messed with Hero Clicks in quite a while but I watch a lot of guys at the shop still play Uh, what else have we got here? Did anyone play Old Necromunda? What gangs did you play? Oh, a lot of people played Old Necromunda. I never played Old Necromunda. I watched it a lot at conventions because I wasn't yet, um, I wasn't yet getting into the game, and I always thought about pulling the trigger and getting into it, but I was nervous about getting into painting and doing all that stuff. This is in the mid '90s. Um, man, that was the furnace. That's very strange. Um, so yeah, it was kind of weird, and um. So I, I never really played, so I didn't really get into any of the gangs, but I know a lot of people here in the chat did like it, uh, so that's that's uh, going to be cool. Twerch asks, anyone know when we get Giant Killer Robots? Um, I believe still they're planning on December, so it's coming. I've gotten a couple, because I'm going to be getting, I did the Kickstarter for Giant Killer Robots. It's one of the few Kickstarters I've done this year. And um, I know that it's supposed to be coming in December. So I did just get an email recently saying, hey, look, we, you know, here's some production models and here's some finished models. And they had to change the size of the box. The box was originally going to be this huge, not quite a cube, but it was going to be very tall and, and quite large. And um, 
they've had to change the box size because it would not fit into the um, shrink wrap machine, which they had not thought of. Uh, so now they had to change the box size and, and, and kind of do all that stuff last minute. So hopefully they're going to be done with that soon. But yeah, we should be getting it soon. Um, hi, Adam. Have you already discussed the recent WizKid slash GW deal? Is this a good thing? Um, I haven't really discussed it. It's not, it's not exactly super... I don't want to say that it's not interesting to me. It's just that I don't play... Cause, because I'm not a board gamer... Like, that's basically what, what WizKids is going to be doing, is they're going to be doing the board game stuff that Fantasy Flight used to do for Games Workshop. So I think they're going to be re-releasing -re Relics, which was basically Talisman, but with a 40k skin instead of uh, Fantasy skin. They're going to be doing some other stuff. They're going to be making a dice game. Um, it's going to be a couple different things they're going to do, which is fine. Uh, but it's not exactly... Um, like I said, I don't really play much of the board game stuff. So, uh, yeah, basically, from what I can tell, they're just basically picking up where, fa where Fantasy Flight left off. So I don't really know much about it other than that. So got some people piping in with which, um, which gangs they like to play in Necromunda. We've got some Escher, Goliath, Orlock. Yep, cool. Uh, old Necromunda had awesome bits for conversions and customization. Yeah, I, I, the new models look amazing. Um, they're going to be, I think, generally a little bit bigger, a little bit beefier, like a lot of the new stuff is. So that'll be kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Let's see. Sir Kazik says, Old Necromunda here too. Spires all the way. Mecha82 says, New Necromunda is the first time I get a chance to get into it, so I never played the old version. I'm going to go with House Escher. It's going to be a very different rule set than the old game, too, um, from what I understand. Because basically Shadow War Armageddon is pretty much the old Necromunda rules. Because the old Necromunda rules were based off of 2nd or 3rd edition, I forget which, 40k. So, um, so if you want to play the old rules, kind of like Necromunda back in the day, then you play Shadow War. If you want to play the old gangs, but with a new rule set that they're putting out... Um, then you need to play the new Necromunda. Now, like I said, I'm hoping that they're going to be sending me a copy. Uh, they said they were, so I should be getting it maybe, like I said, this upcoming week. The main thing I want to focus on, because the new um, Necromunda can be played two ways. The new Necromunda can be played as a board game, kind of, sort of like uh, down here. Uh, uh, where'd the box top go? Sort of like Star Saga, where it's basically tiles and cards and things like that and whatever. But it also has something different that Star Saga doesn't, I don't think, in that you can play it three-dimensionally as well. So they've got a set of rules in there about the more three-dimensional, which is what people who played Necromunda in the past are used to. So I think the benefit to that is it's a single game that has two different ways to play. So if you're trying to get your, your friends who are you know into... Uh, you know, board games into it. You play with the tiles and you do the flat thing, but you want to play with your friends who are into war gaming and you're looking for a cool skirmishy gang on gang war game. Then you play the three dimensional way. So, my plan is when I get it, uh, I'm going to definitely kind of you know really dig in and look at the, what the three dimensional rules look like and how that's going to work. And then I'm going to go through and look at the plastics and all that stuff. But it doesn't really come with terrain per se. It comes with tiles to walk around inside the thing. But it's not like it's not like the box set that they had for Shadow War, which came with all kinds of cool terrain and three-dimensional stuff. So it's an interesting thing they've done with the two games because they've basically made... Like, Shadow War is old Necromunda, and new Necromunda is a different thing altogether, kind of, but still using the old gangs. It's, it's, it's interesting. So it'll be, seeing, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what people think about it. So Rolo's Reviews. Hi, Adam. I love your videos. How long have you been painting models for? Um, hmm. I started painting in the late 90s? Yes, technically. I started painting in the... Well, hmm. I was going to say I started painting in the late 90s. Technically, I painted before that because I did paint Battletech models for a while. But what I was doing with my Battletech models is I was painting using enamels. So, like, when I was a kid, I used to do model airplanes and model cars, and you used to paint with, if you're old enough, you'll remember, and I think you can still get them, these kind of square glass bottles from testers, and they were enamel paints. They weren't water-based acrylics. 
So you painted with enamels and you painted your model airplanes and your model cars. And I did like a, I did a B-50, or not a B-52, I did a B-25 Mitchell. I did a de Havilland Mosquito. Um, I want to say I did some sort of fighter at some point. I remember building those and I remember building some cars too, though I don't remember the names of them as much. Um, but yeah, so I built these models and did all that stuff and it was fun. But it was a lot of those weird square bottles and you have to use thinner to clean your brushes into all that stuff. So then when I started getting into Battletech, I was like, well, I got these paints still sitting around in a drawer. I'll just paint my models with these acrylics, or sorry, with these enamels, which, ugh. So they looked like garbage. And then I didn't paint for quite a while. And then I started getting back into it. And like I said, I think it was late 90s. Um, and that's when I started getting back into painting again. And I, I initially started doing some dipping, you know, like where I would paint them and then dip them into um, like Minwax. Um, not so great. But uh, yeah. So anyway, you you know, it's 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 been about that long, roughly, since the late '90s, really, since I've been since I've been using acrylics and kind of the right kind of paints for this kind of thing. So definitely. Uh, John Harrison, watching your older live streams gave me some other games to look at. I like the look of War Machine. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people. War Machine's one of the more popular ones out there. If you look at like the top five sellers, uh, really, it's. The top five sellers in tabletop wargaming these days are X-Wing, 40K, Age of Sigmar, War Machine, and Hordes. Now, the, the um, order changes a bit. For the last two quarters, X-Wing was at the top, and then it was 40K, and then I think it was War Machine, and then like Hordes and, and um, Age of Sigmar were sort of switching around. I believe this next quarter it will easily be 40k on top because of the release of 8th edition. 8th edition stuff's been selling like crazy. Um, so I think that probably 40k will be back on top, but I don't know that for sure. I don't know that the, 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 the company that releases this information is this company called, it's a website called ICV2. Um, and anyway, so they release it once a quarter, and um, that's where I usually get my stats from. It's aimed towards retailers generally, but I you can, anybody can go look at it. Um, Anyway, so the ICV2 list is generally those as the top five. So, you know, War Machine and Hordes are definitely right behind, generally, uh, 40K. And, you know, like Age of Sigmar and stuff like that. And there's a lot of people that play it, but not every place. Like some places, like right now, like where I live, there's very few players. But if you go down south to, Mil to Milwaukee area, there's a lot of players for War Machine and Hordes. So, you know, it depends. There's pockets everywhere of most games. <clears throat> uh, Anion says, I magnetize my Shadow War Scouts. Has come in really handy so far. Yeah, magnetizing is, I mean, it's a lot of extra work up front sometimes, but it's really nice to be able to swap. You know, you rather than building two models, one guy with a plasma pistol and one guy without, you know, depending, if you want to be pretty WYSIWYG, you can just make it so that you've got one guy, but the, the arm comes off, you know, and you magnetize it and you put a different arm on. And I've done that before with... Um, like sergeants and captains and things like that. You don't do it with every last guy, generally. You do it with more of the HQ units, or at least even within a specific squad. Sometimes you want your sergeant to have a plasma pistol. Sometimes you want your sergeant to have a melta pistol or whatever. You know, that kind of stuff. Depends on the army. So, yeah, that kind of jazz. Um, hey, Adam, I just wanted to say thanks for all the hard work and consistent content. Creators like you help move the hobby forward. Much love. Well, thank you, Mini Painting Studio. I appreciate it. Um... Being consistent has been uh, a big deal for the channel. Um, when I first started nearly five years ago, I started in March, early March of 2013. And um, when I first started, I would go weeks in between videos, sometimes months in between videos. If you go way back and look and you follow the dates, there are some that it's been like, well, I haven't made a video in like a month and a half. I guess I should sit down and make a video. And then in September, late September... No. Well, in September of 2015, I hit 10,000 subscribers. And then in October of 2015, mid-October, I decided, you know what I should do is I should just, I'd read a bunch of stuff about how consistency was important in YouTube channels. So I said, you know, what I should do is I should actually just sit down and start making my videos every Friday. And that's what I started doing. So it, I just passed the two-year anniversary of doing that back in mid-October, and I haven't missed a Friday yet, so, um, knock on wood, but, um, 
yeah, that's been that's worked out really well because as soon as I started doing it and started being consistent and doing it every week at the same time on the same day, I started watching my analytics like that line's moving along and then also it just went like that. And so um, it's been really good for the channel and it's allowed me to be able to to teach more people and to reach more people and to be able to get hopefully more people into the hobby. And I keep talking to people at conventions and stuff like that. And they're like saying, hey, you know, I appreciate it and thanks for, you know, because I really was able to start painting and start playing and things like that because I was watching your videos. And that makes me feel good. But I also, that's kind of the mission of the channel is to get more people into the hobby because I think it's a good hobby. So um, there you go. That's where that's at. Uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, Chick-fil-A. That's interesting. All right. Uh, let me see here. Where else are we at? Uh, there's a lot of conversation going on. That's good. Glad to hear it. Uh, Riot 54 says vehicles are also a good option for magnets. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to magnetize something, it's a little bit easier generally to magnetize a vehicle than a person. Like with a... Let's say like a space marine type person. If you're going to try to magnetize the arm on, you've got to drill into the where the arm would go generally, and say where the shoulder. Then you have to drill into the arm and get a magnet in both and get them all set up and then glue it and all that stuff and everything and make sure that the polarization is right because otherwise you'll stick the arm on and it'll shoot off, which you don't want, um, you know, if the poles aren't connected properly. Magnetizing a vehicle, you just have a lot more space to work in. Um, so you don't have to, and you can use bigger magnets, and sometimes you can even just use a magnet and a piece of metal, and then you don't have to worry about the polarization issue, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I've got friends who magnetize like sponsons on like Imperial Guard vehicles or on Space Marine tanks and things like that. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of different opportunities for that kind of thing, and just keeping your stuff customized that way. So um, it. If you're going to magnetize, you may want to start with vehicles just to kind of get the hang of it and then move into um, units, you know, like not entire units, but like a like a boss or whatever, because it can give you some nice options. Uh, Zoltan says, actually, me and my friends here in Hungary are loving to play Infinity, the game. We're almost more fond of it than other games combined. Yeah, Infinity is growing quite large. It's still, you know, not in the top five as far as sales are concerned, but it has grown leaps and bounds in the last three years. Um, the third edition came out a couple years ago now, I think, and that's really, I mean, I, you know, you go to Gen Con, you see some, there's an entire room that's just Infinity, and they have big, you know, there's a lot of people in there uh, having a good time, and, and it's become a kind of a con uh, not a congregation, that's not the right word. It's become a community uh, that is really um, interesting and, and they're, you know, they all know each other, at least especially at you know, a convention like uh, Gen Con, or sorry, Adepticon. Um, but yeah, it's it's really been growing and doing well. There's a lot more terrain out for it now and you're seeing, you know, they keep coming up with, with more and better models. So yeah, Infinity is really, it's a, it's a very dense game. It's a very deep game. Um, it's not necessarily for me partially because of that, but uh, I do have a bunch of people that I know that like to play. So, yeah, it, uh, it's been doing out really well. Two Heads Talking. Shouting out to Uncle Adam from the Isle of Wight. Well, that sounds fun. Isle of Wight. I've, yeah. Uh, well, hello, uh, Two Heads Talking. Um, I've heard of the Isle of Wight. Uh, I've never been there, obviously. I don't have a passport. I really should get one because I should probably travel somewhere. Um, actually, hopefully... Maybe next year or maybe the year after that, I am thinking about going to Canada because of the, um, during Valhalla, I was having a conversation with Mini Wargaming Dave, and if you've been watching their channel, they just recently bought a new building, and they're going to be, over the next 9 to 12 months, turning it into the big, you know, Mini Wargaming bunker, and it's going to be huge. They just did, he just did a video last week, Dave did, I think it was Dave and Quirk walking through, I think Quirk's on the camera but walking through the, 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 the building they bought and showing like where everything's going to go and what's going to go on and all that stuff. And it's really, it's long. It's like 50 minutes long, but it's, it's really going to be cool. So um, he mentioned during, a, during Valhalla that he was thinking about at some point, once everything's all built, they want to have kind of a special event with YouTubers and then have like, you know, people come and, and do a thing and have an event and a bunch of stuff. And so I've always been kicking around the idea of going to visit them. So I may just wait until once, you know, that happens and then go visit. But um, I don't know. I'd like to go to England at some point too and maybe see what's going on over there. So anyway, 
Yeah, but I don't travel a lot, and I should get myself one of them passports. That's what I hear. <clears throat> uh, Alicia says, not sure if I should magnetize my Lord of Change so he could look like a Scarlet Macaw and a Scarlet Macaw with two heads. I don't know much about the Lord of Change. Um, I know that sometimes magnetizing can be really hard. Like magnetizing an arm onto like a Space Marine, you know, where you just swap off the entire arm and shoulder pad and then put a different one on depending. That's not super hard. Like I've done that. I've got a Demon Prince of Corn who I tried to magnetize his wings and that never worked. Like they would never stay on and I eventually just ended up like gluing them and putting some green stuff over them and so now they're not magnetizable. There are still magnets inside of him. Uh, like up into shoulder blades, but they just would not hold. It was it's it's bigger piece. Like putting a sponson on the side of a tank, not so hard, but completely swapping out like a head or like an entire like let's say imperial knight arm, so you can put a different weapon on. Sometimes that can be a little difficult. Depends on the model. Um, if there's anything, I do wish the Games Workshop would make some of their kits a little bit more designed for magnetization. But I guess I sort of understand why they don't. Because honestly, they would like you to buy two kits so that you could have both options, whereas you'd like to buy one kit and have both options. So, you know, but I don't know. Maybe they will eventually start to go down that road. Old GW, it totally makes sense why they would not want you to magnetize. Newer GW is like, well, if it's a choice between being able to magnetize and then buying the kit so you can do so versus not being able to magnetize and then I'm not going to buy the kit since I can't magnetize it, then, you know, they may make those decisions. So anyway. Phil Morris says that building is crazy big. It's going to be amazing. Talking about the mini wargaming bunker. Yeah, it's like 9,500 square feet. Um, yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. And then, the, yeah, the walkthrough video was pretty impressive. It was, I mean, it, it's an old flower shop, but there's a lot going on. I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's just like, like there's the main front area, which they're going to turn into a store. Like they've got somebody else who's going to be coming and running a store. They're not going to run the store, but they're going to lease it to some other, some friend of theirs who has a store. It'll be, I think that guy's maybe second store or third store. That'll be happening. And then they'll be going through all that stuff. Um, and then there's going to be like a big event area downstairs. And then the people will be able to stay upstairs. If you're going to come to visit, instead of staying in a hotel and all that kind of stuff, you'll be able to stay in the rooms upstairs and things. It's pretty interesting. <clears throat> Uncle Adam, can you do us a big favor as part of your airbrush shows? Can you show us how to thin Citadel paints for airbrush, please? Nobody else has done how to thin them that I can find. Um, I generally thin paints. I don't use Citadel air. I don't use Citadel paints too much through my airbrush because the thinning can be a little weird. Um, I do use a Vallejo airbrush thinner if I'm going to try to attempt it, and all you're really doing is just trying to get the paint to look like the thickness of like milk, preferably skim milk versus say like whole milk. But that's kind of where I'm at with it. Generally, when I'm painting uh, with my airbrush, I'm almost using, almost always using a Vallejo, either Model Air or Game Air paint because those you don't have to thin because they're designed for airbrush. Um, now, I'm not saying the Vallejo paints are designed for airbrush. There's the Model Color and the Game Color lines, which are designed for regular brush. It's the Model Air and Game Air ones that you can just basically put right into your airbrush and work great. And they generally have, for each color in the model, in the in the model color or game color line, they generally have a same version of it, but in the model air or game air line. So if there's a, you know, such and such color here and in, in in game color, there's also a game air. That's the same. Why did I go out of focus? Uh, there's also a game air color. It's the same color. It's just thinned, you know, pre-thinned for airbrush. But if you use a thinner. Like I like to use Vallejo thinner on other on other things, but there's also Golden makes a good uh, medium thinner for airbrushing. Um, I don't know if Liquitex does or not, but there are other companies out there that make airbrush thinner, and then you just add that. Now some people will tell you, oh, use Windex or use alcohol or whatever, and that's I like to use stuff that's kind of designed for it. Um, other people are like, well, I'll use Win Windex because it's cheap, and that's true, but I'm concerned about long term and whatever. So. Um, but there are lots of videos out there about how to thin your paints, and there's not a step-by-step -step guide because it totally depends. Some paints are thicker. depends on how old the paint is, but what you're trying to do is get the thickness to the point where it's kind of like milk, and like I said, closer to 1% or skim and not whole milk. 
I don't know if that's maybe getting a little too specific, but there it is. So. Uh, Alicia says, one, I think one way to avoid the issue is to use a magnet on one part and ferrous metal on the other part. Yeah, and it's, I've, been, I've seen some people do that, and it's a really smart idea because then you don't have to mess with the polarization. It's just hard to find something like a very small piece of ferrous metal. Um, there's there's a, a podcast called, uh, what the heck is it called? Um, Life After the Cover Save, and they were talking about magnetizing backpacks, and what he was using was... I think like tin cans, like, you know, like that soup or like, you know, corn or whatever comes in. And he was using some sort of punch on the lids to be able to punch out small circles of the metal. And then he would glue that to the backpack and then you could just swap it. But it's hard to find tiny little pieces of metal that you can glue to the backpack or whatever part you're trying to magnetize to do that, which is why I think a lot of people usually go magnet to magnet. But if you can find like a good piece of ferrous metal that you can buy in bulk or if you do have a punch you could punch it out yeah it would be way easier to just glue that to the backpack and then put the magnet in the guy's back and then you don't have to worry about which side of the magnet is which and then you can just stick it on there and it's awesome plus it also saves you if you're only using one magnet per thing as opposed to two or three or four i mean really if you magnetize an arm to a person you use two magnets but if you're only ever going to put that one arm on there, then there was no reason to magnetize it. So if you're going to actually have an option in arms, then you're really using three magnets because there's the one that's on the body and then there's one that's on each option of the arm. The more options you make, the more magnets. If you just put the magnet in the person and then you put the little disc of ferrous materials or whatever in each of the arms, then you're saving yourself magnets. So that's I got to find some good sources for like little pieces of metal that I can either punch out or something like that that would be good for that because that would be really nice to be able to magnetize stuff that way. Twerch says, I'll never understand why GW put their air paint, air, air paint line in pots. They do make an, air, uh, an airbrush paint line. They are in pots and not in droppers, I will agree. Uh, I think it's just because they already had pots and they didn't have droppers. So it was probably just a, a simple... It's probably just a simple money situation if they would have had to go out and get a completely manufactured different bottles or get bottles that were already manufactured from somebody else and manufacture labels to fit on them and the different all that jazz because they don't really sell a ton of airbrush stuff like they want you to use the like for primers that are colored they sell primer color cans you know you can buy like you know ultramarine blue in a spray can you can buy like a bunch of different colors in a spray can they want to be able to get you into airbrushing, but they're not going to necessarily bend over backwards and make it super easy. So you can still use droppers and move the stuff. But yeah, it would have been awesome. if I would have bought all of the GW uh, air, air, airbrush colors if they would have been in dropper bottles. So I've bought a couple here and there online just because I'm like, these will be really useful for a certain project. And I bought a couple of them, but I haven't even used them yet. So I, I know I'm going to have to use like a little dropper to transfer the stuff, which will be a pain, but there it is. Um, Riot54 says, I use a quarter liter distilled water with a drop of Dawn, that's the dishwashing detergent stuff, to make a flow improver. Yeah, I could see that. That makes sense. Um, Model Air Metallic, or Model Air Metallics also work fantastic as a brush on paint. It goes on smoother than most other metallic paints. Yes, it does. The Model Air Metallic Chrome color is spectacular. I don't know if I've posted pictures of it. I thought I did. Uh, if not, maybe I did a live show a while back where I showed some of the new stuff that I've been finished painting recently for um, Chaos, my Chaos Army. I did a Forge Fiend, and he's got all that crazy trim all over him. So he's mostly painted like dark gray slash black, and then there's the trim all over him, and I did that trim with the uh, Vallejo Model Air Metallic Chrome, and it is seriously one coat, no brush marks. I don't, it's magical i don't know what the heck's going on there but it is pretty astounding um yeah i was really impressed so definitely something to look at there if you're interested find if the vallejo model air metallics not all of them some of them i feel are not are still like you need kind of two coats but that chrome oh man worked spectacular um 
let me see here. Uncle Adam Vallejo has a Mecca color airbrush line that is airbrush ready for Gundam models. Haven't tried it yet, but they have some interesting wash colors. Spotted it at Hobby Town on Friday. Yeah, I've been hearing about their new Mecca line, and I've been interested in taking a look at it, though I don't paint like Gundam or anything like that, but it's kind of interesting. I'd be interested in seeing that. Krylon makes a magnetic brush-on primer. It's more for using on a wall, but might be something to look into. Oh, that's interesting. Make the entire model magnetic. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, I think I've heard about the magnetic primer for like, yeah, like making basically like a magnetic board. You know, like if you're going to spray it on a wall or something. That's kind of cool. Hmm. Um... Nuada says, I don't understand why any of their paints are in pots, talking about GW. Eyedroppers are so much better. Yeah. They are, except for washes, in my opinion. I prefer my washes to be in pots because then I can just dip in there with the brush and then use the wash. Like, I love secret weapon washes, even though they're really more glazes than their washes. The one downside, though, is that I have to dropper them into something else and then dip into it. You know what I mean? Like, because I don't generally put washes on my wet palette. Although with secret weapon washes, sometimes I do because they need to be, if you want to use them as a normal wash, you kind of actually have to thin them a little bit, um, just with water. But um, for normal, if I'm trying to use the normal washes like as a glaze from, from uh, secret weapon, I have to put them into some little cup or something like that and then go from there because I can't just dip into the paint. So for GW washes, I love the fact that they're in the pots for every other paint that they make. I agree, I wish they would get on the boat with everybody else and pretty much just do dropper bottles because you just take a dropper bottle, you drop it onto your wet palette, a couple of drops, you move it around, you add just a touch of water, thin it a little bit, and you're, you know, you're off to the races. So it works out really well. Um, DeMont Halt, which I'm probably mispronouncing, says, I always transfer Citadel paints to dropper bottles. It works best with my wet palette. See, that's exactly what I was just talking about. The, the, the dr dropper bottles direct to wet palette, that's, that's lovely, uh, in my opinion. Uh, what else have we got? A lot of talking about people moving their stuff to dropper bottles. Uh, blunt syringes are 100% the way for go for transferring paints. Was five times faster with way less waste. Well, that's good to know. Um, Alicia says, I need. I guess I need to find dropper bottles somewhere in bulk. There are 40 pots in my drawer right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different... I have seen some videos out there, or pictures at least, of people who are doing it. So there's probably a blog post or something somewhere you can look up and find that information. Uh, Nuada says, I tried the magnetic primer before. It didn't work that well. It was too weak. I could see the layer being relatively thin and not being super great for that, so I, I could understand that. Um, Torch says, I agree, Adam. I left my washes in the pots. The rest I transferred. Yeah, I can see that. Topher says, Uncle Adam, are you interested in playing Necromunda? Um, yeah, I mean, I am, definitely. I, and like I said, hopefully I should be getting a copy next week. Um... Even though I was never, like, I was interested in it when I was younger. Uh, I, like I said, I used to go to conventions a lot, and I would sit and just watch, like, games. And it's, you know, they, they, those guys were already playing, but I would get to sit and watch and learn about it and stuff, and I would ask questions, you know, and not try to be a nuisance, but I would get to ask questions and see stuff. And I was always interested, and I was reading, you know, White Dwarf stuff about it and everything, but I just never quite pulled the trigger. It wasn't until actually much, much later. I want to say in, let's see, we bought the house... Okay, so it was probably about 2008, 2009, somewhere around there. I went to a local convention in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, called Fire and Ice. And I, they have a, a, a game auction there, and you walk around and look at stuff. And they had a copy of Necromunda from 1995. And it was still in the original shrink wrap. Now, this is, like I said, nearly 2010. So this game at this point has been... Like, they haven't made any more, really, but it's been out of print since, like, 2000... Well, since before 2000, so it's almost 10 years old. Well, more than 10 years old, actually. So, anyway, it's still in the original shrink, and I'm like, ooh, and I knew the people online were interested in it. And they had the... Uh, the opening bid was for $30 for this game, which the sticker was still on it, and it said seventy nine ninety five. So I... Uh, but there was a buy it now price of 60 bucks. The convention... Or the... Um, Auction opened at 1 p.m. So I just basically kind of walked around and walked around. And then at 1 p.m. I went over there and I, 
I grabbed it and I walked it up at the table. I'm like, I'd like to use the buy it now price now, please. And so I paid 60 bucks for it. So I had this completely unopened original box set, Necromunda, the big main starter box with the terrain inside and all that stuff. It was cardboard terrain, but it had little plastic parts to connect it and all that stuff and all the models and everything. And I sat on it. For, that was late February. I sat on it until just before a dep- or sorry, just before Gen Con, so like August. And I hadn't decided whether I was going to open it and start playing with it or if I was going to sell it. And finally, just before Gen Con, I'm like, I'm going to flip it. So I threw it up on uh, on uh, eBay. And I believe a gentleman from Barcelona eventually won it. And I think that I sold it to him with shipping for like 260 bucks. So I made my money back, obviously. Um, but yeah, it was pretty cool. So uh, yeah, I... I that was the thing, but I there's times when I'm still like, oh, maybe I should have held on to it. But now that they're making a new one, you know, with new models and all that stuff, I feel to some degree, um, you know, okay about the fact that I did flip it and sell it. So definitely. Um. Okay. VJ Morph says, "How do guys?" There you go. All right. I believe Epic Duck Studios did a YouTube video of transferring pots to dropper bottles. Um, I've heard of Epic Duck. They share, or at least did, I don't know if they still do, but they did share studio space with um, Guerrilla Miniature Games, Ash Barker, and with uh, Owen, uh, the cooler, Gaming with the Cooler, who I talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, you might want to check on, I mean, I'm sure if you look on YouTube, you're going to find a video about how to transfer stuff to dropper bottles. So there's definitely the case. And then what happens is then you've got all those regular you know the regular paint pots left over and what a lot of people do is then they use them to stick models to when they're using them as like a handle so douglas asks how do you feel about the new large size of gw washes and pots uh i prefer the smaller pots less waste if knocked over the improved value is nice if you're not a klutz like me yeah i i don't know like i can see the benefit especially for the main colors that i use which are basically the black the brown and the sepia but the fact that like some other weird colors that I'm not going to use that frequently only come in the large bottles now is sometimes kind of a bummer. Like, it's not like it goes bad, as far as I can tell. Um, and yeah, you are going to spill more if you knock it over, but, uh, you know, the answer to that is try not to knock it over, but we all know how that doesn't necessarily always come to plan. So, yeah, it's difficult. Um, yeah. Any word on when GW will be releasing various Necromunda gangs? So I'm assuming, like, follow-up, and I don't know that answer yet. I don't know that they've published anything about it, but I get the feeling it's going to be a relatively fast follow. Like, Necromunda will come out, just like Shadespire came out, and then like a week or two later they started coming out with the extra you know, factions, and they're going to kind of keep moving in that direction. One of the things that's really a benefit for us these days is people who, do, if, if you do like and buy the stuff from Games Workshop, and I didn't know this till recently, it used to be that there was one design team, and they had to put out stuff for Warhammer Fantasy, Warhammer 40K, and stuff for the, um, what do you call it, the the specialty games line. And that's why it used to take forever for stuff to come out, because there was only one group of people who were able to put that stuff out. Now, there are technically three different groups of designers. There's a group of designers that works on 40K, there's a group of designers that works on Age of Sigmar, and there's a group of designers that works on the specialty games stuff. So they've got three times as many designers now, from what I understand, and so, therefore, they're able to put out stuff, which is why we see so much coming out of them constantly. Like, some people say, well, Jesus, I wish they would slow down a little bit. But, you know, there's other people who are like, I'm so glad that, you know, I bought Blood Bowl and more teams came out and I didn't have to wait a year, you know. They came out pretty quick. So that's cool. I get the feeling they're going to do the same type of thing for um, Necromunda, most likely. They didn't need to for... Shadow War, because Shadow War was designed to work with the the, the normal line of, uh, you know, 40K models. But for uh, Necromunda, because of the way it's going to be gangs and they're very specific models, they're going to have to keep cranking out these different gangs. And so, yeah, I'm, I think that's the way it's going to work. Like I said, I don't have any specific dates, but I think that they're not going to be sitting on their hands. So, let me see here. What else have we got? Uh, search for uh, you search on Amazon for precision tip glue applicator bottle. Evidently, some people think those would be cool for um, transferring your paint bottles into. <clears throat> what else have we got? VJ Morph says so keen for the Skaven faction in Shadespire. Yeah, that's gonna be kind of cool too. Um, like right now, like I said, there's the skeletons and there's the orcs and the next ones that they're mentioning. They're in the main 
rule book for the Shadespire are, I think, Fire Slayer Dwarves and Skaven that are the next two after that. Beyond that, we don't know, but I'm sure that eventually you'll have... You'll most likely have Seraphon, a.k.a. Lizardmen. You'll probably have um, uh, Sylvaneth, you know, that kind of stuff. They'll add on stuff like that at some point as it goes along. You know, like, I'm sure that they're also hedging their bets a little bit. Like, if it doesn't sell well and people don't really seem that interested in it, they're not going to necessarily push any after that, that initial six. But as it goes along, you know, people will be like, oh, okay, cool. And then hopefully, you know they'll keep cranking it. Because I'm sure they've got the stuff already designed. They're just deciding whether or not they're going to actually start the manufacturing or not. I'm sure the designs are finalized for a whole bunch of factions past the initial six, but they don't want to necessarily pull a trigger and start actually squirting plastic into molds uh, or even maybe not even making the molds yet. Maybe the molds are made, but probably not. I'm assuming they don't actually make the molds until they decide, yes, absolutely, we're going to manufacture. But I'm sure that the designs are done, or at least very close to done. Maybe, like, not completely finalized, but they've already got... A plan of what they're doing, you know, past the first six. It's just, I don't know. That just seems to be the way it goes. I've got my Skaven Blood Bowl team built, textured, and primed brown, and I need to get, get finished painting on them. Well, it's 11 a.m. It got a little bit lighter for a while, and now it's a little bit darker again. But anyway, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody who came to um, watch me fumble through this uh, unboxing under a camera that was a little bit too close. Um, I, I will fix that eventually and try to figure out once I move everything down the basement I'm going to try to figure out second camera a little bit better um, and so then we'll see how that goes but um, I want to thank Mantic for sending me a copy of Star Saga and uh, uh, allowing me to be able to show you guys what's in the box and uh, I'm looking forward to playing some games with it and trying it out like I said I'm a fan of Dungeon Saga so this will be uh, fun as well um Anyway, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope everybody has a good rest of their day wherever they are, and I hope that uh, you transfer some paint into some dropper bottles if that's your thing, uh, or don't, you know, it's up to you. And um, I'm going to turn the furnace back on and uh, try to warm it up in here a little bit, and I'm going to go to lunch with my wife. So um, I'll be playing some Shade Spire a little bit later this afternoon. Maybe I'll take some pictures and put them on social media, and you'll see that. Otherwise, I'll see you guys again in two weeks for the live show. And uh, always remember, Fridays, every Friday, I'm cranking out another video, and we'll see you then.